John the Baptist first called as he began his career as preacher was a call to go serve in the desert. That's a tough first call. I can still remember call night at seminary when a classmate of mine received his first call to St. John's Lutheran Church, Nassau, Bahamas, and we all went crazy. But John was called to go serve in the wilderness, and he was called by none other than the prophet Isaiah. In the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. Make straight a highway for our God. From his pulpit at St. John's Church of the Wilderness, John preached, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And the response he received was impressive, to say the least. Then all Jerusalem and Judea and all the region around the Jordan were going out to him, and they were baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. Now today, we see that the scenery is quite different for John. Turns out, not everyone who hears John's call to repent takes it as good news. The call to repent always has a specific application to the one who hears it. My sins are not your sins, and your sins are not mine. Some want to repent and confess their sins. Others want to hide and deny their sins. And still others want to boast and glory in their sins. So John's call to repent reached far and wide, and it reached high and low. It reached high all the way to the highest levels of the government. King Herod had taken his brother's wife to be his own, and John said, repent of your adultery. But rather than repenting and confessing his sins, Herod had John locked up. Can you imagine that? Being locked up for proclaiming the word of God. So now the scenery has changed drastically. John has received now another call, this time to St. John's Church behind bars, which I just have to suspect for John would have made his first call seem like paradise. But John was not in solitary confinement. His disciples were allowed to visit him, and they told John all the things that Jesus was doing. Now when John heard in prison about the deeds of the Christ, he sent word by his disciples and said to him, are you the one who is to come or should we look for another? From his prison cell where, as we know, he will not be pardoned, he will not be released, and he will be beheaded. All John wants to know is if Jesus is the one who is to come, or should we look for another? For John, in his prison, this is the only question that needs to be answered. This is the only thing that really matters. And the answer that his disciples will bring back to him will determine whether or not John is safe Safe in that it is safe for John to let go of his doubts and let go of his fears and all of his wrestlings with God and simply, simply, simply put his trust in Jesus, surrendering his entire being into his care. Or will it be, will it be that he will need to continue to look for another? who has come to save him. No other answer to any other question matters to John but this one. Are you the one who is to come? Or should we look for another? And it's like that for us too. 
We all have prison cells in which we either are or have been held against our will. The hospital room can be our prison cell. Maybe it's the wheelchair, the assisted living center, the nursing home. It can all be a prison cell. For some, for some it's the very home in which we live. For some it's the marriage to which we are bound. To some it's the job which we hate. To some it's our own body that pains us and won't stop. For many, maybe for all, it's our past. It's our past that holds us in a prison from which there is no escape. For all those who are in prison cells with bars that are made of steel and can be seen, there are countless more who are in prison cells without bars that bars that can be seen, and yet are just as strong, if not stronger, than the steel. John's prison is named for the king who put him there, Herod's prison. Ours are named by what put us there as well. Fear, worry, anger, addiction, jealousy, hatred, pride, prejudice, guilt, and if all else fails, genetics. And if I haven't identified your prison cell yet, then let's just try this one on for size, because it's the prison cell that will hold us all the grave. No matter the dungeon, no matter the prison that holds you under lock and key, the only question that the faithful beg, beg, beg to have answered is this. Are you the one who is to come? Or should we look for another? Because if Jesus is who he says that he is, then I may be at peace even from within myself. If Jesus is whom Moses and the prophets said the Messiah would be, then I may live with hope and I may even be, be a witness to others, even from within my prison cell. Jesus answered, Go and tell John what you hear and see. The blind receive their sight, and the lame walk, and lepers are cleansed, and the deaf hear. And the dead are raised, and the poor have good news preached to them. And blessed is the one who is not offended by me. Beloved, Jesus is who he says that he is. He is the one whom Moses and all the prophets pointed to, who would come into this world to set this world free of everything that keeps it in bondage. Beloved, we have even more reason to take heart in our imprisonment than John the Baptist had in his. For we have even more proof that Jesus is the one than John had. For the same Jesus who was imprisoned, crucified, and died and was buried has risen from the dead. Christ is risen. It is precisely because he is who he is. And all of the prophets and all of the apostles point to him in all of their word that the grave could not hold him as its prisoner. He rose from the dead because death could not hold him. He sprang from the grave because the rock could not hold him. He is the one who is to come and who has come and who will come again to set you free from every prison that holds you, even your own sinful nature, even your own grave. He is coming again to bring you out of the wilderness and the desert and the prison and into his father's house and to his banqueting table and into his joy and into his perfect freedom. 
the same prophet Isaiah who called John to go into the wilderness to prepare the way of the Lord began the call service by speaking his word of comfort not only to John but also to us. Comfort, comfort my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and cry to her that her warfare is ended, that her iniquity is pardoned, that she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. In the Hebrew, it's nachum, nachum, which literally is breathe deeply, breathe deeply. Breathe deep, breathe deep, my people. I hope you heard that. He calls you my people. Make sure that you hear that. This is covenant language, and it means you belong to him. <coughs> Let my people go. I brought my people out of Egypt. You shall shepherd my people. He was cut off from the land of the living and stricken for the transgression of my people. Nothing can separate him from my people or my people from him. Not tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or prison not even your refusal to be comforted can separate you from him. But you say, oh yeah, says who? Says your God, that's who. Again, this is covenant language. I am the Lord, your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt and out of the house of slavery. You shall be my people and I shall be your God. He is binding himself to you and you to himself by his word and his word stands forever and it cannot be broken. Listen, this is all about, this is all about, says your God. It's not about, it's not at all about, says your heart or says your head or says your circumstances, or says your friends, but says your God. That's what real comfort is based on. Says your God. Any other word of comfort is like grass, and all its beauty is like the flower of the field. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of the Lord stands forever. The preacher is called to speak tenderly to Jerusalem. Literally, it's speak to the heart. Not harshly, not harshly like a master to his slaves or a supervisor to his employees, but like a lover to his beloved. His word carries his heart and lays it down right next to your heart and the beat of his pure heart is a pacemaker for your troubled heart. And just what does he speak tenderly to you? Your warfare is ended. The battle is over. The victory is won. It is finished, says your God. Tenderly he speaks to you saying, your iniquity is pardoned. The iniquity that you committed and the iniquity that was committed against you. The Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all, and he was crushed for our iniquities. Tenderly he speaks to you, saying, you have received from the Lord's hand double for all your sins. Not double punishment, but double comfort. Comfort comfort. Again, this is covenant language where the firstborn receives a double share of the father's estate. It is not just comfort, no. It is comfort multiplied and multiplied and multiplied.
not fleeting and temporary like the grass and the flowers that wither and fade, but sturdy and solid and real and eternal. Whatever prison you are in, he comes to you today with his very body and blood in the bread and the wine, speaking tenderly, saying, take and eat, take and drink. And we breathe deeply and we are comforted. Amen.